Hello and welcome to the first of three sessions by the UBC Emeritus College on the impact of COVID-19 on your retirement investments. Today's presentation will explore the Canadian and global economies, future prospects and uncertainties. First, I'd like to start off by taking the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey Campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I'd also like to acknowledge that many of you are joining us from places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of these lands. Now, please note that this event is being recorded for archival purposes and it will be, be posted on the website of the college and you'll receive a link to it after it's been posted. So to start off, my name is Alfred Hamida. I'm the director and professor at the UBC School of Journalism, Writing and Media. I've been at UBC for just over 15 years. And before that, um, I was a journalist for the BBC for going on some 16 years uh, across radio, television and online. And I'm honored to be your moderator for this special event. The format for today is we'll have a presentation by our special guest that'll run around 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have an opportunity for a Q&A session. Now, please post your questions in the Q&A window. Uh, you should see a button for the Q&A window at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Post your questions there and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time we have available. Now, this is the first of the three sessions on retirement investments. We'll have more details on the other sessions at the end of this event. But now to the main attraction and the reason we're all here. It's my pleasure to introduce our very special guest speaker, Dr. Michael Devereaux. Michael is a professor in the Vancouver School of Economics at UBC and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He's been at UBC since 1992. Throughout his distinguished career, he's been a visiting professor at universities and economic institutions across the world, such as the International Monetary Fund and the European Central Bank. And I can't think of a better position to help us navigate the turbulent economic times we're living through and to try to make sense of the uncertainty we're all facing. So please join me in giving Michael a warm virtual welcome. Thank you, Alfred. Uh, so I should, I should go ahead. Okay, and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay, suddenly the sharing screen doesn't seem. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, just give me one. Uh, just give me one moment. Um, okay, here we go. Um, and let me just get this right view full screen. Um, so I hope everyone can see this. Uh, let, please let me know, Alfred, if there's it's not uh, visible. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Emeritus Society. Um, uh, I'm extremely honored to be asked to uh, do this presentation. Um, and I also acknowledge the, uh, that it's, uh, the presentation uh, is virtually uh, taking place on West Musqueam land. Um, so I will... Um, uh, discuss various aspects of uh, the implications of the current um, health and economic crisis for the Canadian and uh, international economy. Um, so it, this is going to be more or less a kind of an idiosyncratic reflections from my, my own experience and uh, not necessarily a kind of a comprehensive encyclopedic um, uh, discussion of, of all the the, the effects. Um, so what, are, what we are in now is really a historically unprecedented uh, global economic and health crisis. Probably the 
you know, in certainly in our lifetime, uh, the, the, the first kind of truly global event where all countries are, are affected by, by this crisis. Um, we're nine months into the crisis now, and clearly we're far from over um, in BC, Canada, or most other countries. Uh, there is really significant uncertainty, both uh, uncertainty in the health aspect um, with respect to immunity, the vaccines and so forth. Um, but most of the uncertainty I'm going to talk about is uncertainty about uh, the economy and the economic recovery. Um, so there'll be kind of a twofold discussion. You know, I'm going to talk about what's happening in the economy now, mostly on the Canadian economy, but but uh, a little bit, you know, more on, on the global dimension, but also the future. I mean, the future, I think, is very uncertain. Uh, I think every, everyone believes that uh, what's happened uh, this year will have very long term effects on uh, on society and the economy. Um, it is quite amazing, and uh, I'm sure that this has taken place in other disciplines as well. There's been an explosion of economic research in the in the last nine months on um, the COVID crisis and the economic in impacts. So it, it covers many dimensions. It's the effects of lockdowns, uh, households' responses, firms' responses. There's a big um, uh, area of integrating economic and epidemiological models, which I'll talk about a little bit in, in, a, in a few moments, uh, looking at viral risks by sectors, occupations, industries. Uh, this has been uh, a notable area where the VSC, the Vancouver School of Economics, has, has invested time in. I'll talk about that as well. Um, the crisis has had huge impacts on unemployment, income inequality, and was likely to have in, in the future as well. And uh, of course, we really need to think about uh, the government responses, both in monetary and fiscal policy. Um, have they helped? Uh, have they been uh, well designed and so forth? So this is the kind of um, uh, these area, th these questions are the ones that uh, economists have, have addressed. So my talk or this presentation uh, will be uh, basically divided into four uh, sub, uh, subsections. They, uh, first of all, I want to document the economic impact of the crisis in, in Canada and show that this is really a unique economic event. Uh, then I'll step back a bit and uh, discuss a little bit more on the research uh, on uh, health costs versus economic costs um, and really posing the question of whether there is a trade-off. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, you know, whether we can open up the economy, um, or the costs of lockdowns and so forth, present some evidence on this. Then I'm going to talk about the policy responses, as I mentioned, uh, you know, particularly in, in Canada. Um, have these policy responses been big enough? Have they been well designed? What are the long-term impacts? Uh, and then I'll finish by talking about some kind of more uh, kind of broader issues about the implications for the global economy. Okay, so let's just start with uh, the experience in BC and Canada. You know, as we all know, we had, uh, starting on March 16th, we had BC declare a state of emergency. We had this immediate closure of schools, bars, restaurants, all non-essential businesses that could uh, not be maintained through remote working. Um, the federal government uh, and other provinces almost simultaneously acted, did the same thing. So what was the impact on the economy? Uh, let's just look at kind of recent economic history. Uh, we had this dramatic fall in Canadian GDP. And this was unlike anything in historical memory that we have no data on an event like this. If we just look at uh, the movement in Canadian GDP, real GDP, uh, from 97 to 2020, uh, that little bump in the middle of the panel of the, the figure is the global financial crisis. The economists call this the GFC. That was at that time seen as the biggest crisis in Canada uh, since the Great Depression. And we see that that was a pretty significant uh, fall in GDP. The current COVID crisis uh, beginning in March and April this year was three times as big. Now, 
granted, we have bumped back a little bit since then, but I'll be talking about that uh, in, in a little while. So this is really from an, an, an economist point of view, uh, we've never seen anything like this before. Um, now, the recession was very different, not just in scale, but also in type. Uh, economists have studied recessions. Of course, this is a, you know, a big area, a big issue, a big um, question in, in my field. Um, a typical recession is driven by a big fall in demand. Uh, you know, consumers stop buying, uh, firms stop investing. There's a fall in aggregate demand. So if we think about you know, some of the notable recessions we've had over the last decades, 1981, there was a very large rise in global interest rates. In 2000, we had the collapse of the tech bubble. In 2008, which I just noted on the graph uh, in the previous page, we had the financial crisis after the housing bubble collapse. Now, the COVID crisis, the current crisis is very, very different. It's not a demand collapse, it's a supply collapse. It's an induced recession, the shutdown of major sectors in the economy. So uh, suddenly the economy fell off a cliff. Now, uh, one might imagine that, well, that's okay. We can just open up once the pandemic uh, eases and you know we're back to square one again. Well, that's not uh, likely to happen because the fall in supply will cause further contractions in demand. There are these what we call multiplier effects and the recovery is by no means guaranteed after the pandemic ends. Uh, and we know that we're still in the throes of, of the pandemic. Um, Let's just compare the 2008 recession to the current recession. So in 2008, uh, we had, you know, as we know, a very serious uh, uh, recession and uh, kind of a, a mini depression in the Canadian economy. There was a big fall in the goods sector, that is the production of goods. The service sector, you know, which is accommodation, food, travel, uh, personal services, firm services, that was more or less unaffected. Now compare that to the current recession. The, both the goods and service sector fell much more, but the, the notable thing is the service sector fell as much as the goods sector. So this is you know, capturing the, the, uh, the, the supply effect uh, of, of the recession. Moreover, the, it looks like up until October this year, the service sector really has not recovered at all. So there's likely to be uh, significant long-term damage to this sector of the economy. Now we can look at different um, decompositions. Let's look at the effect of unemployment by gender. Uh, we see that both uh, males and females employment, according to the uh, StatCan labor force survey, fell precipitously in April, but the impact was much bigger and more persistent for women than for men. This is likely to be associated with problems in childcare and schooling. Uh, but nevertheless, that, that is something that uh, suggests that we're going to have a kind of a serious uh, persistent effect uh, different, differentiated by gender. We can also see that job losses were much worse for the young than for the old. If we uh, break down by, uh, by age group, then the 15 to 24 year olds had a much bigger fall in the initial uh, re recession than uh, in, the, in the initial drop. Than, uh, than older age groups. Now, um, where are we now? That is what we'd like to know. So, you know, we know that there was a, a huge collapse in uh, the early part of this year. Uh, but from this, it looks like uh, that we've had what economists are calling a V-shaped recession. Uh, unlike the recession of, two, of 2008 and nine, this is the, um, the, the movement in overall employment relative to the baseline, which is the months that the recession started, uh, which is normalized at one in both, uh, in, both fig in both lines there, we see that the fall in employment was much greater uh, this year, uh, but it looks like we're kind of back uh, to where we were in comparison to the 0809 recession. Now, um, one problem with this is that we do not have the latest data from uh, the November labor force survey. Um, so this data is up to date in the sense that it's October data, 
Uh, but now, as, as we all know, things are changing so fast that October data has already become out of date. Uh, so, but we can look at some other data which suggests that this rapid recovery of jobs and output uh, may not be um, uh, may not be you know so so um, robust. Um, so these figures uh, above, as I said, were mostly published before this second wave hit us. In the last month, we've had a big deterioration in in the data in pandemic data. Uh, so there are some suggestions that this these are going to spill over into economic activity. So if we look at Google Mobility data or Open Table data, the Google Mobility data tracks uh, people's uh, uh, use um, track people's activity by cell phones. If we look at this for Canada, we see that you know in the late fall. Um, the activity in retail and in transit and in work, uh, they peaked but started to fall down again. So it suggests that you know we're going back into a period of weakness just because of the uh, the, the explosion in the in the uh, the, the numbers all over the country. Uh, similarly, we see for restaurant reservations, we see that you know open table reservations in Toronto have fallen. Uh, since the, the late summer, uh, Vancouver is kind of looking weak again. So um, my uh, conclusion from this is where are we now? Well, it's hard to say, but the current um, outbreak or re-outbreak of the second wave is likely to lead us to significant weakness. Uh, I'll talk about some long-term effects in a few minutes. Okay, let me kind of switch gears now to the second part of, of the talk, which is, you know, that pandemics and economic modeling. As I said, there's been really a big explosion of work in this area over the, the, the last few months. So um, there's the classic model of epidemiology, uh, which um, many of you know about, and of course, many of you will be much more versed than I am uh, with this is, you know, the SIR model, susceptible infected recovered, which is a mathematical model of infections arising from human interaction. Um, now in the basic model, uh, infection behavior, uh, behavior is taken as fixed. Uh, or exogenous, in, in, as economists use in their, their uh, slang. Um, now, there's been a big recent adaptation in economics to um, model how people adjust their behavior to virus risk. So if we take the, the, the basic SIR model, which I outline her, here, um, we have a group of susceptibles, uh, infected, and recovered. And you become infected by interaction between susceptibles and, and uh, infected, uh, existing infected. So the critical parameters in this are beta, which is the rate of infection when susceptible and infected groups interact, and gamma, which is the rate of recovery, or um, there's also uh, some uh, uh, deaths uh, from uh, the infected uh, group. Now, they, so the, the critical determination of this, of the dynamics of infections is what's called this R0, which is uh, beta over gamma, which is the, essentially tells us the number of infected, uh, uh, the, the, the number of in, infected uh, individuals that any one infected individual will, will uh, likely generate. Um, now, the, the economic uh, co contribution over the last few months, many papers have worked on this, is to look at how economic adjustments, economic behavior uh, changes this parameter beta uh, and uh, looking at how people respond in the workplace, how re people respond in retail, in transit and so forth. Um, now, uh, what I'm going to show you is some uh, results from work that I and others have done in, in the Vancouver School, um, where that uh, the dashed black line here gives a basic uh, SIR model, uh, which is uh, capturing the dynamics of infections um, when behavior is fixed, when we just take behavior from the data. 
take that beta from from uh, into data, we see that we have uh, over months. This is uh, uh, this is sorry. This is weeks in in the data. We see that we have a big spike in infections, and uh, because infections have um, uh, damage in the economy, we, we have a, a fall in consumption or GDP on the right hand side. Now the blue line here is what happens when people adjust their behavior. So we see that even if we do not have any lockdowns, uh, even if there's no policy response, people will adjust and we'll have a smaller number of infections, but we have a much bigger fall in GDP uh, because people move away from the workplace uh, we have a collapse in the service industry in restaurants, hotels, travel, and so forth. So I am showing this because I want to get the message that there is very unlikely to be a trade-off between the economy and the disease. Uh, what I mean is that, you know, if we did not have lockdowns, uh, some have suggested that we could just let the economy run its pace and many people would become infected, but at least we'd save uh, GDP and save employment. Uh, I think this is, you know, a, a myth um, that, you know, even if the lockdowns were not there, we would have had a huge fall in economic activity. Now, some evidence from this uh, can be seen by looking at international data. Uh, this is economic growth versus infections. Uh, for different countries over the 2020 period. We see that the countries which have done worse uh, in terms of overall infections have also done worse in terms of overall growth rates. So the message from this is no, there is not a trade-off between the economy and, uh, and containing the disease. Uh, we need to do both. They're complementary, not substitutes. Um, let me uh, briefly talk about what the Vancouver School of Economics has been doing for the last few months. Uh, beginning in March, the VSE started a very large data construction effort. Um, and uh, this led to what's called the VSE COVID risk tool, which is available on the VSE website. What it is, it's a granular measure of health risk associated with uh, for the Canadian economy associated with occupations, industry, living situations, income level, family size, age. Uh, so it goes, drills down into uh, details of um, different, as, uh, different categories, um, looking at the viral risk associated with these activities. Uh, this has uh, been aided by StatsCan giving us access to confidential census data, uh, of course anonymized, so we, we don't know individual uh, identities, but it, it has allowed the VSC to construct um, this risk reward comparison for over 300 occupations in 100 industries. And the goal of this is really to inform public policy on risks uh, of opening up the economy. Let me show you a picture of the COVID risk tool vis visualization here. On the horizontal axis is the sector employment loss between uh, February and April this year. On the vertical axis is the risk. And each of these little dots gives us a different occupation. And the size of the, the dot the, is um, the, the overall employment or the size of that occupation. So we see that accommodation and food and retail trade had uh, both a very high risk index in terms of viral risk. Uh, if you were working in a restaurant or um, you know, a, a food court or something, you're likely to be exposed to, to viral risk. But also those uh, industries were, were uh, th those occupations had the biggest fall. Uh, finance and insurance, of course, is uh, relatively um, safe in the sense that people don't interact very much, and but they also did not have uh, a big fall. Uh, so uh, what this uh, gives policymakers is a way to do, you know, look at the kind of risk return trade-offs uh, in a very, very detailed uh, level, a granular level for uh, the, the um, uh, the province and the country. So this is available for uh, both BC and Canada uh, and Quebec. Um, 
so let's move now to my next overall kind of um, uh, topic, which is uh, economic policy responses. Now, of course, we know that the early lockdowns left millions without jobs and income. Now, if there had been no response, we would have faced this specter of mass poverty. I mean, suddenly uh, people from all point, uh, points of the income distribution were, were not working. So as we know, the federal government responded uh, massively with very large transfers and loan guarantees. So there were all these acronyms, the CERB, the CWS and so forth. Uh, and many aspects of these have been extended in September uh, and have extended over the next year. Now, that inevitably led to a huge increase in government borrowing. Um, how big in comparison to other countries? Well, uh, Canada has actually had the largest fiscal response of any country. This picture um, gives the change in the cyclically adjusted primary fiscal balance. And we see that Canada's fiscal balance went to about minus 20% of GDP. The next biggest was Britain and then the US. So Canada's response has been enormous. Now, uh, one point uh, that should be emphasized about this is that Canada was already in pretty good fiscal shape uh, before the crisis. So the line here gives um, Canada and the US uh, responses. Uh, the red is Canada, the blue is the US. Well, we see the US already started before the crisis with a really significant deficit, over 6% of GDP, whereas Canada was uh, basically in balance. There was a deficit, of course, but in terms of relative to GDP, it was, it was quite small. Um, so we are still in, in uh, decent shape. One uh, question is, what is the impact of these fiscal measures? You know, were they useful? I think that is clear. I'm going to give some more evidence on this in a minute. Um, but this is, a, I think, a, a, a really interesting picture. It gives households income in Canada um, and uh, GDP in Canada, and also for, uh, for seven other countries. The blue is household income and the red is GDP. And if we look at the top left, we see that household incomes in Canada rose during this crisis despite, despite a fall in GDP. In fact, there was a, you know, it was a huge increase in household income. Um, now this is quite unprecedented. And uh, some economists have suggested, well, in fact, that the federal government overshot. It was kind of an overkill in the sense that uh, the saving rates of many households have actually gone up during the crisis. Uh, this is particularly true for the high income households. Um, now, nevertheless, we should make the point that these transfers have been very effective. We don't have the data for Canada, but if we can look for the US, this is from Raj Chetty's Opportunity Insights, which is uh, an amazing resource for um, uh, real-time uh, information on the, the COVID response in the US. If we look at uh, this data, we see that spending rose dramatically for low-income quartiles in, uh, after the stimulus payments were received in middle April in the US. So the point is that the transfers uh, were, were very useful, particularly for low-income households who lost, lost employment. The question is, you know, there, there has to be some uh, trade-off, there has to be some you know, overall balance. Um, what is the, 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 the appropriate uh, fiscal response? So we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a minute or so. Um, now let's move from fiscal policy to monetary policy. This is more, in fact, in my area of work. Uh, so what can the Bank of Canada to, to respond to a crisis like this, or what should they do? Now, in normal times, which is, you know, we've kind of forgotten what normal times are, but in normal times, the bank can reduce interest rates to respond to a recession, to stimulate demand. But interest rates were already very low, uh, 
in uh, just before the crisis, and they've reduced interest rates now to 25 basis points. That's uh, the bank rate, or 0.25%. So this is what the governor calls the effective lower bound. So we can't really reduce interest rates any more than this. Um, so the bank uh, kind of pivoted and changed direction and uh, engaged in what they call quantitative easing or QE. So you may have uh, seen QE uh, mentioned in, in many news reports. Um, what QE is, is essentially uh, involves a very large purchase of, of assets. The government of Canada bonds, treasury bills, provincial bonds, commercial bonds. So the bank goes out into the market and purchases these assets from the government, from, uh, from uh, commercial banks, uh, from uh, provinces from directly from firms issuing com commercial bonds. Uh, so this is what the Bank of Canada's balance sheet for 2020 looks like, uh, starting with um, a balance sheet of about $100 billion, they've gone to about a half a trillion dollars in the past few months. Uh, so we see particularly the, the red line there, the bank has bought uh, a significant amount of government bonds. Uh, so in, in effect, the, the bank is helping to fund uh, the government response, the fiscal response to, to the crisis. What does QE do? You know, why did the bank go and do this, you know, engage in this large scale asset purchase? Well, the theory is that first of all, it reduces market risk. So essentially the bank, the central bank provides a backstop. Uh, so without this, uh, the cost of borrowing for firms, uh, investors may skyrocket. Uh, so by kind of putting a floor on this, the bank reduces risk. Uh, QE also tends to reduce long-term relative to short-term interest rates, uh, what economists call the yield curve. It flattens the yield curve. And since long-term interest rates really determine investment behavior rather than short-term interest rates, this may kind of help to stabilize the economy. And, and finally, it encourages more lending on the part of private banks. Essentially, the Bank of Canada is buying uh, uh, securities from commercial banks, increasing their reserves and increasing their ability to lend. Yeah. Okay, these are you know, the two big policy responses, fiscal policy and monetary policy. Now, let's kind of examine these in a bit more detail. Uh, so the questions we might ask is, should we worry about the large deficit? Um, relatedly, is the Bank of Canada just printing money? And if so, what are the consequences for inflation down the road? Um, so it's certainly true that the deficit has increased dramatically this year as a result of these fiscal responses. But note that federal debt is still low even after 2020, the latest numbers we have that federal deficit will go from about 40 to 50% of GDP. Uh, so this is much lower than, for instance, in the US, which is now about 100% of GDP, and much lower than other countries, uh, which are much higher, even other advanced economies are much higher than 100% of GDP. Um, but the key factor is not the debt itself, but debt charges. You know, how much revenue is required to service the debt. And uh, the red line here, the, the blue line is the debt itself relative to GDP on the left axis. The red line is debt charges, the service account relative to GDP. The remarkable thing about this is that debt charges relative to GDP has actually fallen this year. Uh, why is that? We've in massively increased our debt. Well, the reason is that interest rates are so low. So the government is essentially able to borrow at almost no uh, cost at all. Now, of course, this is not guaranteed to stay, to continue into the future. But right now, um, the, the prediction for interest rates is that they'll be staying low for a significantly long time. So one therefore may conclude that, you know, currently, the fiscal response is not something that we have to worry too much about. Of course, it, it is important that we have a plan to stabilize over the long term. Uh, what about the, you know, the monetary response? Uh, 
is the bank, is the central bank just printing money? Well, essentially, it, it, yes, the, the central bank is printing money. They're financing government debt by crediting the government's account to the central bank. The government then makes transfers to households. Now, uh, of course, in a deep recession, this can actually stimulate economic activity. And this is, this is you know, why it's happening now. We have the, the bank is facilitating the fiscal response of government. Uh, but the government is committed to honor this debt. Uh, so ultimately, it is government debt, which is you know, a liability of the Canadian taxpayer in the long run. And as a long-term proposition, we really can't fund deficits by issuing money. You know, uh, deficits have to be funded by, uh, uh, by taxpayers in, in the long run. Um, another point to note is that you know, currently, we haven't really had any inflation. In fact, the inflation has been remarkably low, despite the, you know, the massive increase in the government deficit and the expansion in the Bank of Canada's balance sheet. And it's been, inflation is still forecast to continue uh, uh, at a pretty low rate for the next, uh, for the next few years. This uh, is a Bank of Canada survey, which shows the share of respondents predicting inflation greater than 3% over the next two years. So we see on the left-hand side there, um, all of the businesses surveyed in this, you know, about only about 5% of these businesses think that inflation will go above 3% uh, over the next 24 months. So inflation expectations, which are a critical factor in the dynamics of inflation are what economists call well anchored. Uh, we're not expecting a lot of inflation uh, in, in over the next few years. Um, now here's some international evidence. You know, many central banks have engaged in significant QE, quantitative easing, over the last decade since the financial crisis. Um, the, on, uh, we see that the banks like Japan and Switzerland that have expanded their balance sheets dramatically have actually tended to have lower inflation. So again, uh, the worry about inflation, at least for the medium term, is, is not... Um, uh, warranted. So let's look at over a longer horizon, though. Uh, there are likely to be very persistent costs of this crisis, what uh, has been called scarring effects. And government, uh, Governor Powell of the Federal Reserve mentioned this, this word in his testimony to Congress the other day. Uh, so scarring effects we think of, there's likely to be uh, really persistent effects of many business failures, especially in services like travel, accommodation, uh, food services. We're likely to have really a, a lot of sectoral reallocation. You know, I think uh, many um, uh, commentators feel that, you know, that there are going to be a long term effects on economic activity, the types of economic activity that um, uh, people, households will engage in after this. We're likely to have less travel, less physical retail, less urban living. So, you know, uh, the, there are many, many unknowns in this. Uh, however, the point is that fiscal support for recovery uh, will really be required uh, and will require continued deficits and, and direct spending. So uh, this huge sectoral reallocation is likely to require significant aid from government. On the other hand, there is a risk that government subsidy policies may prevent or slow the readjustment. So again, there's always a trade-off um, in involved, and uh, you know there's tons of uncertainty here. Okay, now let me skip then to the last uh, section, the, the last topic I want to to discuss, which is the prospects for the the world economy. Uh, so let's think about kind of three big questions. What are the implications for international trade and globalization? I think, you know, many commentators suggest that this really uh, harkens the end of the, the great period of globalization. Um, we talk about, you know, global coordination. You know, do, should governments coordinate? Do we need a global response plan? And uh, finally, kind of the, the threats of uh, threats of, of trade protectionism. So uh, this figure shows, uh, taken from a Harvard economist, um, shows the 
dynamics of the world trade over world GDP uh, over the last 50 years. So we all know that globalization has been a really important uh, trend in, uh, in the world economy, particularly from 1986 to uh, the basic 20 years to 90 or 22 years from 1986 to 2008, there was you know, a rapid increase, almost a doubling of the size of world trade to world GDP. This was associated with you know, the, the um, increasing uh, preponderance of global supply chains where the production of many manufacturing goods was distributed through across the world, associated with the rise of China, the rise of emerging markets, uh, information technology. All these factors led to uh, a huge increase in, um, in world trade. So world trade grew annually at about 4% faster than world GDP. Uh, but note that globalization started to, um, uh, to slow down uh, after the financial crisis in 2008. Um, so we've had this period of what's called hyper-globalization has already started to slow down. Uh, so it's likely that uh, this you know, slowdown will continue. But um, the uh, economists who've been studying this uh, and or, or looking at the impacts of COVID, uh, think that you know it's it's you know that this uh, technological forces for global supply chains and uh, global integration uh, is likely to continue, um, and I'll kind of present a little bit of evidence on that in in a minute. Uh, but the the point of this is that you know this period of hyper globalization uh, it was not going to be was not going to continue forever in any case. Um, so whether the COVID crisis will slow this down further or not is, is open to question. Um, now let's talk about global coordination. Um, and this is a kind of a, a very interesting uh, uh, issue, and especially for me, because in the 2009 crisis, I was kind of involved in a lot of the discussion of this. So, you know, as we remember, this was the last big uh, recession, the last big economic shock uh, that most of us have experienced. Um, a really critical difference between 2009 and 2020 is that at that time, there was a large agreement on a global effort to recover from the global financial crisis. And in fact, Canada was central to this. Um, there was a G20 meeting in 2009 that was overseen by Tiff Macklem. Now, of course, he's the governor of the Bank of Canada, but then he was deputy minister of finance. Uh, and uh, I've just patched in, you know, the communique from uh, this London summit in April 2009. Uh, this was the, the, the G20, the 20, uh, one of the 20 largest uh, nations in the world. Um, who acknowledged that they face the greatest challenge to the world economy in modern times and a global crisis requires a global solution. And uh, that's a picture of Tiff Macklem there in the corner. Now, of course, uh, in a complete contrast, we have really no global response. And the reason, of course, is that the US being a central player in convening any uh, such response is now completely detached. So if effectively, you know, we're moving uh, on in this crisis and the recovery period is likely to take place without any kind of global uh, coordinated strategy. So that I think is, is uh, significantly worrisome. In fact, uh, more than just the absence of a response, we have uh, an increasing protectionism. So the World Trade Organization uh, framework, the overall framework is kind of unraveling. So it's fewer and fewer countries are um, uh, following uh, World Trade Organization directives. It has, its power has been significantly weakening over the few years. There's, there's been little progress on regional trade agreements and protectionism has increased. This is a picture of average US tariffs on, on China over the Trump administration. Uh, so what worries me is that the, the recovery period will precipitate what's been called beggar thy neighbor trade policies. 
And this was one of the, the key failures of the Great Depression in the 1930s, where many, many countries uh, imposed high trade restrictions and that prolonged uh, the recovery from, from the Great Depression. We've already seen some protectionist policies on PPE and medical supplies. So this is uh, significantly worrisome. Uh, let me though end though on, on one you know, relatively optimistic picture. Uh, if we look at this picture of world trade and world industrial production, this is from uh, the International Monetary Fund, we see that you know, world trade fell dramatically in the middle of this year, but now it's picked up significantly. Um, so if this continues, then you know, there's some optimism that you know, the, the global economy is, like, it will, will recover um, over the next year or so. Um, okay, so I'm going to end there. I think I'm kind of pretty much out of time. Uh, conclusions, well, it's hard to conclude on what's going to happen when we're still in the middle of a crisis. I just say that this is a truly global shock. It's got to be one of the largest events in, in our lifetime in terms of economic experience, social experience, human experience. Uh, the situation is still changing um, day by day in, in, in BC and Canada and many other countries. Uh, the future is uncertain. Uh, there's some optimism about a vaccine and a return to normality over the next year or so. Um, but what I conclude is the new normal may be very, very different from the old, old, the old normal, uh, you know, both on economic um, areas and, and, and society. Okay, so well, thank you for your time. I appreciate uh, your attention. Thank you, Michael. That was absolutely fascinating. It's a really good perspective. Um, I'll remind all people who are watching that they can post their questions in the Q&A section, the Q&A um, window can be accessed by clicking at the bottom of your Zoom screen on the button that says Q&A. Um, Michael, I just want to start off by picking up um, on one thing. When we talked about the global impact and protectionist impact. Of course, we've seen a protectionist thrust in the US under Trump. Um, what, how do you see the impact of a Biden presidency? Is, and do you see that as, as shifting some of that protectionist impulse, particularly in terms of relationships with Canada? Um, I think that my feeling is that as regards Canada, Biden is definitely good news. Uh, so the uh, US decision to um, put tariffs on aluminum uh, exports to the US for security uh, for um, 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 US, I can't remember the term they used, uh, sec security reasons was, uh, you know, really a, a complete fabrication. I think those kind of uh, highly aggressive and, and um, uh, um, hostile uh, uh, trade acts, at least for, from the point of view of Canada, are likely to, to diminish. But uh, we have to remember that, you know, the Democrats really are the party of protection historically uh, relative to the, you know, the, the Republicans. Uh, so I doubt if the, um, the China tariffs are going to come down very quickly. Uh, the U.S. and China are still in, you know, a, a relatively aggressive situation as regard trade negotiations and even have been uh, before the, the Trump administration. Uh, the one thing I would say, though, is that, you know, the Biden administration um, is much more likely to abide by the global rule book than we've seen over the last uh, four years. Uh, so there is some hope for that. Uh, but, you know, even before the Trump administration, um, the, the effectiveness of WTO rules and, and um, you know, the... Um, uh, the the deviations, you know, into kind of uh, global uh, or regional agreements and so forth, uh, were were uh, becoming more important. So um, there is um, there is still that. And you know, the final point I would make is that the you know the, the Trump trade policies didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, we did see 
a very large reaction to globalization in many countries, particularly in the US, but also in many parts of Europe. And part of that has been uh, the, the reallocation effects, the employment losses from trade policies. So the pressure coming from, the, from this uh, reaction, you know, the, this kind of anti-globalization uh, social forces is likely to continue, I would say. So I want to pick up on one of the questions that's coming in. Please continue putting all your questions. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, one asking, um, is there any hope of a global response without the participation of the US? Uh, well, of course, yeah, I, th I think so. And, you know, there has been uh, some uh, developments in, in, that, um, in that respect. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, 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 up to uh, at the moment, I uh, you know, um, but uh, but you know, really, you know, as the major economy, still the major economy in the industrial world, I think it's uh, it's very like you know, it's very, very difficult to imagine a response, um, you know, a, a truly effective global response, um, and of, you know, of course, from the point of view of Canada. Um, you know, Canada cannot really gain from a global coordination uh, without without the U.S.'s participation. I would say. Um, so, one of the questions has come in is um, for faculty contemplating retirement. What are some of the direct implications when for faculty who are thinking and, and planning to retire in the coming years? Okay, well, uh, that, you know, that includes me, I have to say. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I would um, hesitate to make any forecasts. I mean, you know, the, the risks uh, for uh, retirement faculty, of course, are, you know, risks associated with investments and the stock market and inflation. Um, it's very, very difficult to say uh, what I feel the consensus view on inflation risks is that currently, over the next few years, they are low. Uh, but we have we do have some economists arguing that you know over the more medium or long term, because of this explosion of government deficits and increasing uh, uh, central bank financing of deficits, we do have inflation risk down the road. Uh, of course, there are ways to protect yourself against that, but I, you know, I'm not an investment advisor, so I'd be very hesitant to, to make predictions. Well, a more direct question then for you. Somebody's asked, have you, have you adjusted your retirement portfolio since COVID? Uh, I, you know, I, that's, that's more or less a personal question, so. <laughs> <laughs> I realize that, but it's a, um, and they follow up for that question was um, in terms of US interest rates, are they going to go negative? Do you see that happening? Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. My, my guess is no. Um, we've had experience of negative interest rates in the ECB and in the Reichsbank in Sweden. Um, generally, uh, negative interest rates are not a silver bullet. Uh, some economists, we've had a, a number of economists arguing that, you know, interest rates should go deeply negative. Of course, there's a problem putting, pushing interest rates negative because, you know, if you're getting, you know, minus 10% on your, uh, your bank deposits, you can simply take the money out of the bank and hold it in your mattress at home and get 0% re relative to negative percent. So there is some kind of lower bound on interest rates that can be charged. Um, now, the, in the Swedish case, uh, interest rates went negative to, uh, I believe, about 1% or as a little over 1% negative. And, um, uh, but that has ended now and they, the um, Reichsbank and the Swedish Central Bank essentially felt that, you know, the costs of having negative interest rates in terms of distorting uh, the, um, uh, the, financial, um, uh, uh, the, the financial economy were uh, too great relative to the benefits. So I would say it's unlikely that we'll have negative interest rates. And the, um, the Bank of Canada has essentially already signaled that by saying that, 
we're at quite what they call the effect of lower bound of uh, 25 basis points. So my, uh, that my feelings. Yeah. And you talked about inflation uh, low and continuing to be low. Um, one of the questions is about the impact of business failures, particularly the ones that are most hit by the COVID-19 restrictions that you've seen come up. Um, we're talking, you know, travel, retail, urban living, yeah. personal services. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's really the big elephant in the room. So far, uh, there's little evidence of a huge spike in bankruptcies, but that I think is due to the, um, the size of the government assistance we've seen, you know, both uh, in there's, the, there's household assistance, but also there's significant business assistance, uh, uh, financial assistance to businesses in terms of wage subsidies and, uh, and rental subsidies and so forth. Now, they cannot continue forever. And it's very likely, as I mentioned, that there's going to be really a significant change in the way people work, the way people shop, the way people travel. So we're going to have to have, you know, a big sectoral reallocation. So the airline industry, for instance, is likely to become much smaller over the next, you know, number of years. Maybe it'll bounce back in, in a number of years. But, you know, I, I, I think that uh, there will be a big economic shock in terms of these uh, these long-term effects. Now, government assistance can help with that, but again, as I said, there's you know there's a um, uh, there's a trade-off here. Some uh, experience from Japan, from Japan's long uh, kind of uh, slump over the past uh, number of decades, has been. We can have these zombie uh, industries, which are essentially being held up solely by government assistance. So that's not something we want either. So we, we want to, you know, policies that facilitate the adjustment, uh, but um, uh, cushioning the, the, the negative effects in terms of the economy. So. Because in your presentation, when you looked at uh, the rates of government assistance and the rate that Canada has been provided, you talked about did, you know, you raised the question of did Canada overshoot its COVID response? Yeah. Uh, how, how, what do you, how do you see what it should be thinking about and planning for going forward, particularly with the second wave hitting Canada? Well, right now, I think we have no option but to continue the assistance with this second wave and we're, we're in the middle of it right now. I don't think you know, we, we need to change direction. Um, a couple of months ago, I would have said that, you know, we need to pivot away from subsidies and towards direct government uh, um, spending on certain key sectors to stimulate the economy and to try to get employment back, to try to get people back working and, and, uh, and industries reopening. Um, right now, I think we're, we're in a holding pattern uh, until the new year, and hopefully we'll be having a vaccine, a vaccine coming on stream in in uh, the in the late spring, uh, hopefully, uh, and we'll we'll get um, you know we'll be uh, recovering on the economic front. At that stage, I think it really is important to uh, start to pull pull back on the subsidies on the transfer payments and have direct government assistance for things like infrastructure, um, uh, basically pr provincial um, uh, spending on, on key sectors in order to get the economy starting again. And also, you know, again, a, a key issue will be the, the type and size of the, the readjustment, the long-term readjustment in the economy. So. Do you expect uh, any changes to Canadian federal tax policy? Um, well, you know, certainly if interest rates go up, we'll be paying a lot more taxes because with the size of this federal debt, um, you know, if we get back to interest rates that we had in the early 2000s, you know, of five, six percent, debt charges would suddenly spike. Uh, so a number of Canadian um, uh, business economists have been raising red flags about a return to the kind of fiscal crisis we had in the in the early 90s. Right now, we don't have to worry too much about that because interest rates are so low. But if if interest rates start to go up again, um, which is a possibility, of course, then we we, we really do have a, a fiscal problem, and we'd have to 
maybe go back to, to uh, paying higher taxes. Yeah, related to that, one of the questions talks um, is wondering about the, you know, the deficits and debt that both provincial and federal governments are entering because of COVID. And mm. both, what, what, what do you think the, the impact's going to be of, of that and what measures should be taken at a federal and provincial level to address these, these mounting deficits and debts? Yeah, I mean, that, that is, uh, you know, the, the big elephant in the room or $64 question or however you want to phrase it. Um, the, the deficit situation is really unprecedented. Um, you know, we've, we've never had deficits of 20% of GDP before. And um, we're really uh, amazingly fortunate that they could take place in periods of such low interest rates. So that we don't we we don't have this kind of explosion of the the fiscal costs of deficits, uh, but the key thing is that the federal government and provincial governments are going to have to put together some key plans to um, to stabilize these deficits. Right now, they're not a worry, but without a plan, particularly to stabilize what we call the primary deficit, which is the you know uh, the spending relative to, to taxes. Because if you have uh, persistent primary deficits, then the debt is building up. And then if interest rates go up, the debt is building up. And then the interest cost of uh, debt is becoming a much, much bigger proportion of overall revenue. Uh, so there, there is a worry. But you know, for Canada and for most countries at the moment, we're you know, even though we've had this explosion in government deficits, uh, there does not seem to be a looming fiscal crisis. Um, but, you know, again, the, the key requirement uh, as we're coming out of this will be to put together some fiscal stabilization plans, some key plans to stabilize uh, the, the spending over the medium term. So. What kind of timeline are we talking about in terms of this sort of stabilization and addressing the deficit? Well, I think it's really going to depend on the timeline of the, the virus itself. I mean, you know, in the optimistic scenario, um, we'll be back to quote unquote normal by next, late next summer or next fall. So I would expect then uh, that we'd have, we'd start to have significant consolidation on the fiscal side. Um, now, if again, you know, a lot, as I said, you know, it's just a broken record here. It's a, will, it will depend upon the, the, the path of interest rates. If interest rates stay significantly low as they have been for um, the, a, a few years and now are, are very low and it's likely they, the, you know, the bank and most other central banks forecast interest rates to stay low for the next two, three, four years. Uh, if that is the case, then if we think about the federal debt, it's 50% of GDP, but you know that we can continue with that for a long time. The government will simply be rolling over the debt and servicing the debt, so we don't have an explosive debt situation. Um, so a consolidation, uh, a fiscal consolidation, is not necessarily going to be a very uh, painful experience for the country as it was in the mid 90s. I think many of us remember that. So. Related question that's come in is whether governments should consider a guaranteed basic income, not just uh, now, but in the long term. Yeah, yeah. This is really uh, an issue that's raised its head since, since the crisis. Um, and, you know, there are kind of, on the one hand, the, the experience of um, of this year has been remarkable in the sense that it's shown that despite you know a catastrophic, historically unprecedented collapse in the economy, the overall level of uh, poverty has not fallen um, because of the scope and size of, of government transfers. Um, so that does perhaps open the question of you know. Can we just do this forever? You know, give people enough to to live. Um, the one problem that 
I'd raise about uh, uh, you know the idea of a basic income is that you know this this kind of uniform um, income that we could contemplate giving to all sectors of society seems very costly relative to the benefits. I mean, you know, if we think, well, give everyone a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars a month. Uh, well, you and I don't need fifteen hundred dollars a month, and so it's extremely costly to give a basic income to high income individuals. Uh, so this kind of universal aspect of a basic income uh, seems you know, ill-targeted. Uh, redistribution is you know, clearly an important part of most government's objectives, but a basic income is not, is, you know, only has a small amount of redistribution. You know, we can have a more effective redistributive policies that I, I think than a basic income. Um, of course, you know, there are other economists who, who argue on, on the other side. So I, 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 but I do have to acknowledge that the experience of 2020 uh, and the, the benefit of government transfers and, and the ability to, to cushion uh, the, the most vulnerable sectors has been quite remarkable. So. Continuing on on this theme of, of debt and recovery, um, questions come in. How does climate change play into both recovery plans and tackling deficits and debts? It's one thing that didn't come up in your presentation, but obviously for, for a lot of us, that is the elephant in the room. Right, right, of course, yeah. I mean, I do acknowledge, uh, I purposely uh, uh, kept away from climate change. It's not my area of, of study. Um, you know, I think that it, it's going to be a critical part of, of um, the kind of long-term recovery process. And in some sense, it gives us an opportunity uh, to redirect, um, you know, economic activity. We're going to be coming out of the worst recession on record. Um, there'll be, you know, we have to direct resources to new areas. We have to think of new sectors. I think, you know, as I mentioned, you know, things like the airline industry are probably going to be shrinking. Um, I think new climate change technologies uh, are going to be really important for this. And I, I see that, you know, even today's Globe and Mail, there's news the federal government has, has come out with uh, some new plans on the, the role of climate change in the recovery. So I think, I think that will be, um, a, you know, a critical aspect of the readjustment process. Yeah, it's... Yeah. And how, how far would you say that sort of both at a federal level and provincial level, governments are ready to make this readjustment in terms of spending priorities and sectors they're investing in? Uh, yeah, I think that, um, I mean, it's, everything is political these days, and, but I, I do think that, you know, we're, we're in a, a relatively good situation in terms, in terms of um, uh, federal provincial relations, you know, at, at the, the moment. I mean, we've been in, I wouldn't say everything is... Um, is uh, super friendly, but relative to times in the past. And I think, you know, most provinces and government and the federal government realize that uh, they will have to coordinate on, on the, the recovery process. Yeah, that's interesting, because in the context of what not seen that, like you talk about the sectors affected, travel, the airline industry, retail, urban living, or, you know, office spaces, these density in cities, and the impact COVID has had on that. Um, I just want to follow up, particularly in terms of density in cities. Uh, how do you see the long-term effects of this pandemic in terms of returning back to the, the density in cities or urban cores or the move to the suburbs and potential impacts then on, on both uh, the sort of general economics but also investments? I think that um, I, I would say that that's a little bit overhyped right now. I mean, um, you know the uh, the experience of um, of economic growth has shown us that cities work. That's that these agglomeration effects of cities having people living uh, in proximity to one another, having businesses in proximity, show that there you know there's significant returns to scale. So that you know most economic activity in industrial countries takes place in cities. 
Now, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's certainly the case that, you know, with IT technology and communications technology has allowed uh, for, you know, a decentralization. But it's still the case that, you know, we, we have these hubs, these centers of economic activity um, in the US, we, you know, we have New York, uh, Chicago, the Bay Area, LA, Houston, all the, the, these are, you know, these are not accidentally, you know, thrown together. And of course, uh, it depends on how long the recovery process takes place. But if, if we could get back to, as I said, again, quote, unquote, normal within uh, the next 12 months, um, I doubt that th this will this will have really you know huge qualitative effects on on the uh, the distribution of, of the population. So. Okay. Um, I want to go back to some of the questions here. So one uh, questions come in is why are stock markets so high and seemingly continue to continue to grow and increase? Uh, <laughs> that's you know. As um, you know, I would say in uh, in French, uh, je sais pas. <laughs> I, you know, <clears throat> uh, the stock market is not the economy. The stock market is, uh, you know, a financial fish tank. Uh, it is very difficult to pinpoint, um, you know, exactly exactly what's keeping stocks so high at, at the moment. I, you know, I would uh, not really have a, any any more useful conjecture than any of the per participants. Um, you know, I guess one possibility is that they're, you know, they, they foresee that things will recover very fast. And, you know, these industries that uh, these shares will, will go back to where they were. But, you know, we know historically that uh, the stock market can move up or down in, in very independently of, of, uh, of economic fundamentals or economic activities. So. Um, how would you assess the risk that it's a little bit of a bubble? Um, sure, it's, uh, it's possible. Um, you know, people have cried bubbles on the stock markets before and for, for a long time. I certainly wouldn't be surprised if we had a big uh, retreat, uh, and of course we did in in early March. So in some sense, the the uh, the current recovery is is the um, is the mystery. Yeah, so, um, well, a question around the Bank of Canada and interest rates. Um, uh, could you comment on what might drive the Bank of Canada to unwind its balance sheet, and what impact that might have on interest rates and inflation? Oh, uh, well, I mean, already the bank has eased off a little bit. Uh, that picture I showed showed that um, their, you know, their, their treasury bill purchase has been declining. Uh, and in many ways, the unwinding will take place automatically because uh, the types of instruments that the bank are purchasing these, uh, what they call this uh, uh, repos, um, uh, which are kind of short-term lending to commercial banks, and they they drop off the balance sheet uh, at at a fixed rate every every uh, every month. Um, but nevertheless, there is a lot of persistence. You know, the evidence from the U.S. Uh, the Bank of Canada had did not really engage in big asset purchases during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, but the, the Federal Reserve did. And their balance sheet uh, increased dramatically in uh, 2008, 9, 10. Uh, and it's still uh, significantly higher than it started off before the financial crisis. So this is likely to, to continue. Um, I think you know it's going to be a long time before we get back to the uh, the, the pre-2020 balance sheet for, for the Bank of Canada. Um, uh, as regards the prediction for inflation, I, I don't think there's, it's really a big deal. Um, you know, the bank is printing money in the sense that it's, it's uh, financing government deficits, its balance sheet goes up, uh, bank reserves have gone up, but this has not, you know, transmitted into a lot of excess demand and inflationary pressures in the economy. And the experience 
of quantitative easing over the last decade or so for many countries has been the same. You know, we've had these big increases in balance sheets, but it hasn't, you know, put inflationary pressures. It hasn't led to a takeoff of inflation. And, you know, there's some questions as to why that has not been the case. But, you know, we are in a period of very low interest rates, very low inflation, and, and that's likely to continue, I'd say, for the, the, the next number of years. So. One of the questions that's come in is around gold and um, this argument that, you know, you should buy gold. And, some of the, and so the question is, what are some of the long-term implications or concerns that people could take refuge in gold? Well, I mean, gold is, is uh, you know, the, the typical hedge uh, against, against long-term risk, but, you know, the gold prices are uh, very, very volatile. So you can buy gold and maybe you'll get a big return on it, but you could also get a huge loss on it as well. I mean, relative to, uh, even relative to stocks, gold is, is more volatile. So, um, you know, it, um, it, it, just be prepared to, uh, to take the risk. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time. So I just want to ask you now to look into your economist crystal ball. And um, how do you see the, given that now we're in the second wave of COVID, um, how do you see the effects that's going to have both on the economy in Canada and on the global economy as we look forward? Okay, well, I mean, I basically go back to my, um, my slides and my presentation. Um, I think there is a huge amount of uncertainty still um, as to how the economy will, will evolve. Uh, I think a lot of it, almost all of it, will depend upon how the, the viral risk and the pandemic evolves. Um, you know, the best case scenario is that we look back and see 2020 as the year from hell and, you know, uh, will in five or six years time uh, look back and say, you know, that was pretty bad, but we're, we're uh, luckily we're past it now. And, you know, if we can get through the, the next uh, few months, um, hopefully things will, will improve. So. Thank you, Michael. Um, and I think that brings us to the end of our Q&A. Thank you all for your questions. Really appreciate everything that's come in. Um, before we let you go, we'll again do a virtual thank you to Michael uh, as much as we can um, and move on to just let you know about a couple more seminar, webinars that are coming up on retirement investments. So these two that are coming up, the first one is on December the 8th, taking place at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Um, we invite uh, retired faculty who are current or former members of the UBC faculty pension plan to this specially designed presentation for retirees. Um, we'll have Lorraine Hesselton, Hesseltine, who will outline the retirement income options of the faculty pension plan, the pros and cons, and how to manage your pension investments. Then in mid-January in 2021, we'll have two financial advisors to consider the factors in making retirement investment decisions at these challenging economic times. And following Michael's presentations, one of the key takeaways we can take from this is the uncertainty as we look through to the economy. So we encourage both retired faculty and those contemplating retirement to join us for this session. Now, registration for the December the 8th session is available on the Emeritus College website or via the links in the newsletter or alert from the Emeritus College. Our registration details for the January 2021 webinar will be available shortly. So with that, all I have to say is thank you for attending today's webinar. Please find more events organized by the college on the last slide. There's a whole range of other activities that are taking place that might be of interest. Thank you for spending your time with us. Thank you to, to Dr. Devereaux for his insightful and stimulating presentation. There's so much to digest there. And we'll close this webinar for everybody in the next few minutes. Thank you all very much. Thank you.